All right. It's bourbonblog.com live. We're going to be tasting some great new whiskeys tonight with uh, Legend Ridge Distillery founder Brian Nolte, who is uh, joining us <laughs> live. Are you, in, are you in Breckenridge right now? Where about are you? Yes, sir. I sure am. Doing this home, live in my basement, in the man cave. Live in the, the man, man cave. In the man cave. <laughs> well, it used to be a man cave. Now it's a kid's cave with air hockey and Pac-Man and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's it's a bit of everything and a little whiskey down there, too. And uh, we got several we're going to be trying tonight. Uh, the new Breckett Ridge rum cask finish. You just released that recently. The Madeira, which was uh, very limited. And also the double barrel. We got I got all kind of great bourbons here in front of me. And uh, what's what's I know it's probably been a month and a half, a couple of months since we've talked last. What's been happening there in Breckenridge at the distillery? Yeah, at least, man. Well, it was nice to turn stuff back on after COVID. You know, I mean, we yeah. kept uh, making whiskey, obviously, during the whole thing because we're essential whiskey makers. Yes. But um, <laughs> our uh, retail was shut down. Tastings and tours shut down. Um, Bar and restaurant were mostly shut down. We kept them open and just fed our employees, which right. they appreciated. But um, you know, things gradually came back online, so it's nice to um, have some revenue again. <laughs> and we've just been, you know, we've just, we've just been busy. We've had a lot going on. Um, three new product releases, two more coming on the malt whiskey side. Right. Um, new barrel warehouse up and operational this spring for uh, it's eight thousand square foot just across the street. And um, we installed a new stillage treatment plant um, just recently. So, man, it's just, it's been busy, busy, busy. We're getting ready to build a pavilion outdoors. Um, we, we tend to wait till winter starts to start our projects here, outdoor projects in Breckenridge. So uh, we're staying true to form on that one. <laughs> Why do you do that? <laughs> you know, that's just, uh, I, I mean, you just... Uh, might as well stick with tradition. <laughs> That's a, well, it seems like the way it always goes, man. That's it. Just makes it, it makes it even more fun. Well, if you're watching, I know that it's a lot of fans of uh, Breckenridge Distillery and the whiskeys and bourbons and spirits out there. Ask questions down below, and uh, we'll we'll taste through some new things. And Brian's also going to tell us about some things that are to come with some little sneak peeks. Uh, I think we're going to start. Are we starting on the uh, Madeira finish? Is that what we're starting on? Yeah, um, and I have had a little sip out of it, and I, I am impressed. And I've, I've been looking forward to tasting this with you because this was uh, released uh, just not too long ago. Uh, you have the port and the sherry, which you've had out for several years, but this is uh, fairly limited, right? Yeah, you know, we like um, I from a Scotch background. You know, I love to do the different barrel finishes, and uh, so we have the staples: the PX Peter Jimenez sherry cast finish, which is lovely and has those nice dry dry sherry notes at the end um right. port cask is a crowd favorite everyone seems to love that one the best it's got the you know the dark fruits and um it's just super rich and luscious um but we like to do you know lots of barrel finishes so uh, most recently we did uh we got a couple of barrels from chateau Ikem and did a sauterne finish which were just absolutely lovely and i thought that babies, was very nice too yeah man those were those were super cool but very limited and then um, the Madeira cask is one I've wanted to do for a long time. You know, it's it's it so it's kind of like a cousin to the Porter the Sherry cask. Uh, Madeira is a little cluster of islands that um, are territory of Portugal. Um, they're in a unique location, um, so they're you know uh, west off the coast, but down right off the top of Africa. So they're getting kind of close to the equator, right? So uh, Madeira is a unique unique wine and it's you know typically a fortified wine and it's got a crazy history so first i love madeira by itself but i love the history it's like the most interesting history of any barrel finish you could do so the portuguese back in the day um you know decided to take the grapes down there plant them see how they would do found a few varietals that worked and um and then their plans got all blown up right because it was down by the equator. Things worked very differently for concentrated sugars and all that stuff. And then they had to get it north. So um, Madeira, its history is rich. You know, it had there was a Napoleon blockade where it sat on the ships and just baked in the sun and rocked back and forth. So it was getting hot, oxidized, and it had a ton of motion and wood interaction, which is the complete opposite of what you want to do with port. 
and lo and behold, it actually made it better. So, wow. you know, it's, it's history is really cool. And then, um, in colonial America, um, when the British blocked, uh, the sugar and molasses trade and Americans couldn't drink rum anymore, they all drank Madeira wine. So Madeira wine was toasted at the signing of the declaration of independence, Washington's inauguration. I mean, this has got a crazy cool history. So, um, we always wanted to do it. And then we finally had the opportunity to get some really great barrels. And this thing, it, you know, it just turned out this was magical. So we just put this in a IWSC competition in New York. It got gold. Um, it got 94 points, which I think is, um, you know, the low end of where I would have scored it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's, uh, man, it's just super fantastic. Luscious and rich. Great color on it, too. Just that color. Yeah. And what I like about it the most is the complexity on the nose. And it's got those like big ethereal notes that you're used to getting more with scotch than bourbon. You know, this is a complicated whiskey. And um, it's just, if you thought the port cast finish was sexy, you got to get this. So we, we were just going to do one big release of this. Um, and it's just too good. So we ended up getting more barrels and we're laying them down, um, you know, incrementally. So this, this baby will be a staple. So we will we will see it again in maybe a little while. How long do these? Uh, how long do this actually go in the secondary cask? Um, so it depends on how wet they are, you know, as to how long they go. The first okay. round, uh, call it eight months, and um, uh, okay. I, I think this next round of barrels was a lot. They had a lot more humidity in them, a lot more moisture, so it's probably going to be, you know, quite a bit quicker, but. You know, one good thing about owning a whiskey distillery is every day you just taste through barrels. And right. when you're doing these cask finishes, you just see how they're coming along and you're like, ooh, it's getting close, you know. And then uh, like, oh, it's there. Get it out. Get it out. You got to get out of the barrel because you don't want it to be, uh, you know, over over oak or pick up weird, uh, weird notes. And um, that's what happens if you leave a wine cask finish in a barrel too long. You start getting really weird notes that you don't. They're usually like a dry kind of like off woody note. And so you can't let them go too far. You push them to the very like day and then you're like, okay, it's time. Because a few days, weeks, I mean, that can really matter with. Totally. Oh, man. Yes. So, yes. Like right. days, like a couple of yeah. days matters. And I, I, I remember um, one time early on when we were doing the, the port cask was the first uh, wine cask release. And um, man, it just, it was just, Every like week, it was getting better, 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 and then we tasted it, and we're like, I just don't think it could get any better. And um, so we dumped um, part of it, and then the next day we came back and tasted what we we're gonna dump, and it already changed that one day. Just one day, like oh. something, some chemical, some chemical compound got out of went from um, yeah balance, and that was it. So they're they're and, and they're more sensitive than just your typical barrel because they already have those elements of the wine in there. That's why. Oh, for sure. That. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. the compounds are un unpredictable too. You know, there's hundreds of compounds circulating, going through their cycles in these barrels. The um, all the congeners and things interacting with right. uh, everything in the barrel, and you it's it's this cool kind of cycle. Some of it's known, most of it isn't. Um, but when you introduce something different like a wine, you know, wine in there is just crazy different compounds. Oh, and, yeah. you know, we, um, I love Sherry and we forever wanted to do a Sherry cask release, you know, back going back 10 years, we started tinkering with, with that. And we went from Fino to cream all the way. And we found just one varietal that worked. That was it. It was the PX Pedro Jimenez grape. That was it. The rest of them sucked. And we just wasted the whiskey. <laughs> you said, <laughs> no, the P, the PX being uh, such one of my favorites, and I was so lucky to be there on, I believe the uh, several was it three years ago or four? How many years ago did you guys dump that or release it? Probably four. four. Yeah, we're four, probably yeah. About four. I was there on the day that you all started dumping those casks. I was so thrilled to the the way the nose of those, just the, the smell in the barrels. It just it's there's nothing like it in the world. And this Madeira mm -hmm. is so special. I bet the nose when you were dumping these was pretty powerful, wasn't it? It was pretty awesome. And, um, you know, we, uh, we love where it was going. And then on the, uh, a, a few of the barrels, we had realized we'd gone too far, you know, so Hans had to jump in there and, and, um, dump everything and make sure we pulled out the fractions we didn't like. And there was some tinkering involved on that, that first, uh, 
first release, and I was went from elated to semi skeptical until he worked his magic and you know got the right combination of barrels together, and then you know vatted it all. And I was like, oh god, Hans, how'd you do that, dude? Because it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Like I I I couldn't have done it. Yeah, a lot of talent. You guys are very talented with great palettes. Again, this is the uh, Breckenridge whiskey, Madeira finished. Uh, well, this is actually um, this is this is considered a bourbon, though. Since it's Breckenridge whiskey, it is a, a finished bourbon. It's a bourbon, yeah. So all of our you know non malt whiskeys that say whiskey, they're all a bourbon. It's just you have to declassify. Um, if you do a wine cask finish, you have to declassify. But it's the right. same mash bill. It's a high rye, high rye mash. Same mash. Um, yep. This is very nice. Uh, lots of deep notes, velvety mouthfeel. You get that Madeira, but you get something else when that bourbon comes together with that Madeira. What are you What are you getting as far as flavors? Going? Yeah, it's you know it's it's just a more it's a more complex whiskey. Um, so, I mean, you know, when you think of bourbon, you think of corn whiskey, right? It's a signature. Like it should have its own. Like when when you drink like a basic bourbon, it's like you're trying to pick out little flavors and say, oh, I nose this and I taste this. But when you put that all together, that's bourbon. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's corn whiskey, that's aged corn whiskey, and it has its its own note. Um, what's interesting about this one um, is, you know, it's further away from that than a typical bourbon. Right. Um, it's 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 almost like um, uh, I don't know what the compounds are, but um, when you have an older Scotch, those compounds that start to um, it's almost like umami. In a way, yes. you know, they're like super rich and dark and luscious, and you know, they're kind of they're kind of fruity, kind of malty, um, and that's that's in here. And um, I describe that sort of um, that beautiful nose that you get off of really good scotch. That's kind of solventy. As um, I, I bask it together as the ethereal note, and there's a certain mouthfeel and and flavor with that, and I get that in this. And yes. only, only in of of our non malt whiskeys. So of all the bourbons or you know corn based whiskeys, this is the only one that has that ethereal kind of note to it. And that's yeah. I think what you're. It's hard to put into words, but that's what it is. It's like a ethereal mm -hmm. nose and kind of umami glutamate glutamatey on the palate. Slightly, uh, maybe just a, t a touch of, of smoked, maybe dark fruit, something like that. I mean, there's this really. Uh, it's very yep. light, uh, he heavy, but not so heavy that it feels like it's cloying on the system. I mean, it's very, uh, it's just very beautiful. Uh, again, uh, people can find this at the distillery. Is that right? Yep, that's for sale the distillery and um, and in select markets. Uh, Illinois has uh, there's an account there that requested this, and um, and then uh, there'll be a little bit head heading out to California, I think, if I'm correct on that. And then um, when these batches are gone, then we're gonna we'll have another release, and then we'll make it a, a staple. Incredible! So we eventually we'll see this more and more, uh, just as we've seen the port cask, the sherry cask. We're big fans of those. Again, uh, the Brackenridge Madeira finish. And if you have any questions for Brian Nolt or myself, ask them below or tweet back to us. It's Bourbon Blog Live I'm talking with Brian Nolt. Founder of Brecken Ridge Distillery, uh, such beautiful bourbons, and I'll, you know what? Amazingly, I should say, Happy National Bourbon Heritage Month to you, Brian. This is the first day yep. of September. Uh, we kind of think every month is Bourbon Month, Bourbon Blog, but this is officially <laughs> celebrated <laughs> National Bourbon Heritage Month, and uh, it's amazing what Bourbon Heritage has become uh, since you guys started. Uh, you all started about uh, ten years ago, right? Uh, overall, for the distillery, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2007 was when I had the arguably really bad idea of doing this, and um, <laughs> if you ask my wife, right? And um, yeah, so and then we opened to the public, um, I think in two in 2009, something like 2009. that. So yeah, it's been it's thir 13 going on 14 years for me, and um, staff was uh, early on it was me and Vi. And then we hired someone to like work in the office and we were up to three people <laughs> and now we have 125 employees. So, you know, it's been a, uh, been a hell of a run. Yes, no, it has. And, and since the time that you guys opened, maybe what bourbon heritage me meant uh, back then, 15, you know, 15 years ago, looking back 10, uh, it's really evolved. I mean, there's, uh, you all have helped yep. put, um, bourbons whiskeys and other spirits on the map in colorado um what's that mean to you looking back as far as when we say bourbon heritage month 
obviously we have we have our heritage to thank, whether it's Kentucky or, or Pennsylvania. But this 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 whole last uh, ten years, 10, 15 years, what's what's it meant to you, and what do you what do you see uh, going forward as far as what bourbon means in in America? Yeah, I think that's a good question, and I want to start uh, a big one for you. You know, a big question. You know, that's good. I like it. I like I like <laughs> I like going going heavy. Yes. Um, so you know, in two thousand seven, when I decided to do this, there weren't. I mean, there were a few little or craft distilleries out there, but not a ton. Not, not and I didn't I didn't know a damn thing about them. Um, I just knew that I loved whiskey, and so for me, it was a passion project. And when I went out and um, told people I was opening a distillery, every single person I talked to said a brewery. I said, no, God damn it, it's a distillery. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and people couldn't, you know, they didn't know what, what it even meant. And banks wouldn't loan you money. And at that time, you know, bourbon had, bourbon had been in a long bust cycle. You know, whiskey is kind of like gold. It's boom and bust, boom and bust. Right. And it tends to happen over decades. But uh, when I started, like, you couldn't give away a barrel of bourbon. You know, I mean, right. uh, that's just the way it was. And then for whatever reason, um, that changed. And I think um, different, you know, demographics evolved and hit critical mass. And people started getting a little more adventurous in what they were drinking. And they found out that bourbon was fucking delicious. You know, yeah. and when I was a kid, my dad drank Canadian VO. And that was the only thing he drank and i think there was that one brand loyalty uh you know for a long a long time of the baby boomer generation and then um peep gen x and the and millennial um demographics just, just got a little more interested um and for whatever happened socially and you know whatever influenced people's uh, willingness to try more things people realized how good bourbon was and you know as far as heritage goes um for me, whiskey is all about, about heritage. You know, it's about heritage and quality, but right. the heritage of whiskey and American whiskey in particular is just, is one of those things that's just worth getting out of bed for. You know, I, I really appreciate authentic history and what different things mean to different cultures or countries or whatever. And, and what bourbon means to America and, and all the, the, tough hoeing and blocking and tackling that, um, that the, the traditional uh, bourbon companies did, you know, to me is just, I just have absolute admiration for, for those companies and the people in them and the people that built them and everybody that works at those companies and has forever. And I think, you know, there, there could be a tendency when you're a young whippersnapper to be a little snarky on something. And, and for me with bourbon and whiskey, it was there, that was never, that was that never even entered in into my brain because I just have nothing but absolute respect for everybody that paved the way. And um, they've done a, you know, a service to America, <laughs> you know, in my opinion, it's, uh, you know, you can talk about um, the ups and downsides of spirits and things like that, but uh, it's just special. Bourbon is special. Whiskey special going all the way back to Ushka Bay and, you know, its origins in Ireland or Scotland or both at the same time, whichever, um, you know, story you want to believe. Um, and I love to romanticize about that stuff. To me, whiskey is all about the romance. And um, that's why I got into it. And that's why my wife let me. <laughs> the romance, the love. And you guys have an incredible amount of passion that you put into this whiskey. And uh, thank you. That's I think that's really helpful because we think about the distilleries that are we still consider them newer. I mean, you know, 13 years is a while. You guys have put a lot of effort in, but when you think about distilleries that are hundred years old, plus, oh, yeah, um, you know, does it make you ever, do you ever sit back and think, what will this place look like in a hundred years? Or what would they look back and say about this period of bourbon? What do you, do you ever think about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think you pontificate about the future a lot and, you know, mostly in terms of your viability and when's the next bus cycle going to come or, right. You know, uh, and then you have times like this where you have COVID and political unrest and you think, well, shit, you know, that might <laughs> that might happen pretty quick. You know, it just it puts things into perspective uh, in a new and more um, uh, more of an exclamation point on it. So, um, I mean, I, the short answer is nobody knows, but I, I can tell you this, you know, whiskey will boom and bust. 
it always has mid eighties, half of the uh, distilleries in Scotland shut down and got bulldozed down. And um, a few of them are starting to come back, you know, with the Renaissance of whiskey. Um, but um, I think we've got some time left on this bus um, boom cycle for bourbon and other brown spirits. Um, I think people are interested to see micro distillers and craft distillers get back on their feet yes. and try to get the good projects they've been working on to completion. And, um, you know, with craft or small distilleries, I think it, it's important for um, the new trends in whiskey to, to come full circle and the American malt whiskeys to get enough time um, to come out. I think a lot of the stuff that's been released is coming out too young or the oak is forced. It's aged in a hot location or in a smaller volume barrel. And that does a disservice to the whiskey, but it's a struggle and you have to cash flow. And so I understand why, what people are doing and why they do it. And the temptation is real. Um, it's hard to be patient, especially when you get taxed, like you've already sold it. You know, it's like you lay down the whiskey and you, you're already paying tax on it. Um, you know, because you can't expense that until you, it's bottled and sold and cost of goods. So you're carrying those expenses and acting like you didn't lay that inventory down. It's it's super tough. So I understand why people do it. And I, I think um, American malt whiskey, single malt in that category, if we ever get that name kind of nailed down, um, um, is going to be awesome. And pe pe people oh, will yeah. be blown away. People will be blown people away. I mean, the more that we see more and more um, distilleries releasing American single malts. Do you think that category is going to be become more defined? I mean, obviously you all have done a lot yeah. uh, with yeah, dark arts, which you've released. Yeah, man. I think that's the next big category. And yeah. you know, the large strategic companies feel it is too. And so when they, you know, we're all friends and we all talk and, you know, we, we passed up the opportunities to sell the company to those guys or, or whatever. Um, but we still talk all the time, you know, and, um, that's what they're most interested in. Cause you know, they know they're smart people. They know that that's the next big category. And so they want to, they want a piece and a partnership and things like that. And they should. Um, so I, I think um, you'll see big things from some American malt whiskey producers and, you know, hopefully some M and a for those guys and opportunity for them to, um, you know, be able to take some chips off the table and get more resources to make more whiskey and um, it's you know, tiny. It's not even a sliver. I mean, craft spirits is 2% of spirits and American malt whiskey is 2% of that 2%. It's small. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. Definitely growing and some great, uh, great products like your, your dark arts. And um, it'll be exciting to see what happens next. Again, everyone is just joining us. I know I see a lot of great questions coming in. It's bourbonblog.com live we're happy to be here nearly every night uh check out our schedule and see what's going to be on next uh, we're proud to be brought to you by the independent stave company and uh keep watching us every night at 8 p.m eastern like this uh show here with brian and we have seen some great questions um donald snyder our, our good friend donald uh, in the spirits industry is asking any advice for craft distilleries who are considering opening an on-site restaurant don't. <laughs> I like, I would say uh, getting into the restaurant business is not for the faint of heart. Um, and the only reason I'm super passionate about food as you probably are too, Don. Um, but it's, it's still, it's such a challenge to, to run a restaurant. Um, for, for us though, I've always felt like from the beginning of the distillery that it was imperative to do it. And so um, even though I say don't, sometimes you just know you've got to do it. Um, so uh, if you are going to do it, I would say the very most important thing is bring in an experienced operator because you cannot learn how to run a restaurant. You have to be taught and um, you're, the margins are so minuscule and the expectations are so high right. that um, there's no room, no margin for error. And, you know, nine out of 10 restaurants pre-COVID would close anyway. Um, so it is a tough business. Um, that being said, if you're going to do it, you know, do it right. Just like any, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Um, get people that know what they're doing, make sure your cash flow model works and then, um, and be cool, man. Do like cool, fun stuff. And, uh, if you, you know, integrate great cocktails, um, uh, uh, it's, 
it's always cool if you can get your spirits into your food in different ways and, you know, sort of tell that story. Um, and, you know, I would say for us, there's been a lot of pain on the restaurant side um, and a lot of pleasure. Um, and it's to the point now where, you know, we're very dialed in and I love it and people love the restaurant and I'm so glad we did it. Um, but man, we had, we had some rough years and, um, uh, I always tell our employees, you know, you've got to have it, you've got to have it. And, you know, the, it is hard to explain, but you can tell when a place doesn't have it and a place does have it. So find out what it is for your place and make sure your people have it. And you've got to have that culture of, you know, impeccable service and, um, high performing, a high performing team. And everyone that works all 125 employees at Breckenridge Distillery are either a high performer or they're on their way to be in one. Right. And um, that makes it worth everyone's while to put that extra work in and love your job and actually have fun and not think of it as work. It's an outstanding restaurant you all have there. It's so special. And as you mentioned, the cocktail program, I mean, obviously you want your distillery, no matter where it is, to become a destination. You obviously want that restaurant to become a destination and speak that language of that distillery and find something new to do with the cocktails that, that isn't done elsewhere. I mean, then that's what you all have done. Yeah, absolutely. And you can't underestimate the just learning and didactics and, you know, invest, I would say anybody that's going to do it, invest in your people, you know, uh, get them to learn. And then once they learn and you can trust them, like give them some autonomy and let them go, like be creative. Um, and that's never been a problem for me. You know, it's like, I, uh, I just, I can't wait to cut our people loose and let them just let it rip because, um, that's why we've done so well is, you know, I, I created an environment to let our people shine and just let them do it. And they have, and the best stuff we've ever done doesn't come from me. It comes from them. What's your favorite way that, that, that your people and the restaurant has never infused whiskey into the cuisine? What have, what have they? Uh... Ooh, uh, my favorite. Or just uh, you know, an example of a way. I mean, I know there's a lot of great ways. Sure. Um, well, yeah. I mean, you know, one cool thing that um, our original chef, Dan O'Brien, did that I loved was um, we sort of had similar – uh, palates and liked some of the same foods. And, you know, we, we both like love squid ink pasta and, you know, it's, uh, so we did a, uh, oh, it was, it was a, uh, I forget which, which style of pasta it was, but, um, instead of squid ink, we did barrel char to get, to get the color, you know, that, that black color. Um, that was, that was, probably one of the, my favorite things. And, and that thing has lived on. Um, and we've always kept, uh, like, uh, kept either kept it going or, or thrown it out as special as a, a barrel char pasta. Um, that was cool, but you know, you incorporate it into marinades and sauces and, um, all sorts of stuff. And then, you know, you, um, can dry age stuff in barrels too. And there's just, there's a lot you can do. Um, you know, our executive chef's David Burke. So he's, you know, culinary hero in America and help put American cuisine on the map. And I've never seen somebody so creative and with so much energy. So with that guy, it just never stops you. You know, it's like idea after idea. You're like, no, no, Dave, don't do it. No, I don't, don't, don't do that one. You know, but he'll, like he'll do anything and um, it's cool. And, and it all works because um, he's a master. So you get very talented and just a, an incredible place. Uh, if you get through Breckenridge tour the distillery for sure. And also make reservations before the, uh, for the restaurant because it's something uh very, yeah. very make special. a dinner make a reservation for dinner if you don't make yeah. a reservation you probably won't get to eat there so just make your reservation ahead that, of time. yeah and how is it now now that things opening back up people are, as far as the restaurant scene with your restaurant and other restaurants in breckenridge how's it going right now yeah so you know we're we're at a partial capacity i guess it's 50 percent ish or so and uh, that just makes it even harder so it's just you know it can be really tough to get in. You can get in usually for lunch. We do a barbecue Casey style barbecue lunch. So it looks like a barbecue pop-up and, um, and it's great, but you really should, you know, have dinner if you can. And it's, it's just been sold out every night. It's, just, it's hard to get in. Like I, I, my wife will be like, Hey, you want to be at the facility this week? And I'm like, well, I would like to, but you know, we're going to be taking up spots. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, in, in around town, I think it's been, it's been pretty similar to, you know, the, I think the tourism in Breckenridge picked right back up. Um, we had the whole state of Texas here, um, this, uh, this summer, which, right. um, which I love because, um, you know, if you're from Texas, come to Breckenridge, man, because, um, you all are good people and, um, you spend money. So that makes me happy. Um, so it's been busy and the restaurants have been busy. And so, you know, it's even, uh, I went out to eat with some friends last night and we had to go to we had a car in a couple of places to get in <laughs> on a, on a Monday. You know? Wow. Well, it's good to see places coming back and, uh, we hope the best for everyone there in Breckbridge and all over. Uh, all right. So we're going to, um, I think I may have already poured a little of this. The Breckenridge whiskey. Going in. Double, double barrel? Is that what we're doing next? Yep, double barrel. It's double got kind of, you can uh, try to. Batch, see. this is batch number one. This is brand new, isn't it? Yeah, this is batch one. Uh, this was a very limited release we did um, for one customer in particular out of Georgia. And um, it's been so popular it's been like the number one seller out of our retail shop in breckenridge after we released it so we laid down more and um so this you know I, i'm um open-minded i think when it comes to whiskey but um i like balance and i'm also a super sniffer super taster so for me i like a million subtle things coming together um when we hadn't done something like this before, because, um, you know, when you double barrel age, something is going to be off balance and that's not my style. And I resisted and resisted and finally said, fine, I'll do it for you. And, um, you know, this is, um, this is not my favorite, but people love this one. And, you know, I have to have one that's not my favorite. This is not my favorite because, I like balance, but for a lot of people that don't have such an acute sense of smell, they just get down on this whiskey. And yeah. like I said, it's been our number one selling whiskey out of the retail shop after people try it. They absolutely love it. The thing I like a lot about it is the label. It kind of looks like an old like eighties, like splatter, like paint splatter yeah, throw, like throwback. That. And it kind of, you know, I mentioned earlier, it kind of reminds me of my prom shirt in uh, 1988. <laughs> uh, that I wore a high school prom. It was kind of weird. Like anyway, that's uh, is that what you story, but... a picture of your your prom shirt, and that's how you came up with this. Is that how you? No, it was just it was it just kind of ended up there. And, uh, <laughs> Schmitty, Schmitty, and I. Schmitty's our uh, um, label designer, and um, we you know worked together from the very beginning, and um, we've been together for a, for a lot of years, and um, we kind of like beat off each other and think alike, and that one just sort of. It, ended up there and I, I love it that was a cool one very different but cool it's very it's it's very cool label it's really a, a tasty uh tasty whiskey and what we're getting here is um a lot more barrel uh some real serious depth this tell us about the aging process someone was asking i think it was chip asking down below uh about how old are the whiskeys most of these whiskeys and what about this one how is this aged yep so um our philosophy on doing a blend is always about, uh, we, we start from where we want it to be and we work our way back. Um, we taste every barrel um, as they grow up in any of our warehouses. And we usually put them into one of four categories based off of, of how they're tasting. So there are barrels which are pretty typical bourbon and we call those fruit. Uh, there are barrels that really bring up the rye spice. You know, we do high rye. And so the spicy barrels, that's the spice. Um, there are some that concentrate uh, mature oak. So it's a very pleasant oak. And then um, the fourth category is vanilla. So the vanillin and, and all the, those uh, similar compounds are concentrated and they're, they become super vanilla. So we get these barrels into four categories. The fifth category um, exists, but they're very rare. And so when we have those crazy barrels, either ones that have a super luscious, like high fraction of ethyl acetate or ones that have just unique notes. Like we have some that um, have our anise forward. You know, those are rare. We have two of those and, and, you know, tens of thousands of barrels we've ever found. Um, we pull those aside and we do special projects like Powderhound with those. But anyway, so 
we put them in the categories. We know about how many barrels of each category we need to get the blend where we want it. And, um, and then we blend things from different ages. So um, even though most of our whiskeys say aged a minimum of two years, um, we never put two year whiskey in anything. Um, the youngest thing we typically would put in would be four years or so. And uh, so in this one, uh, you know, as an example, um, there is some four year old whiskey in there. And then uh, a lot of it is in between four and 12 years old. And some wow. of it is, is 12 years old. So we, we blend a variety of ages. Um, so we make a perfectly good whiskey. We blend it um, in a range of, of uh, what we know we need to do, depending on where it's going to go. And in this case, you know, this is going to go, it goes back into a brand new charred oak barrel. And so, you know, we, we went with a blend that we thought would stand up to the oak a little better. And, and it did. And you know, the one thing I can't handle is angular young Oak. I just, that just blows it for me on my palate. I'm done. If I knows that on your whiskey, I'm not drinking it. I'm giving it back to the bartender and walking out. Right. So I, I hate that. Um, and so we had to make sure it would stand up and then we had to give it enough time in the new Oak to mellow, to mellow that out. But um, before I forget, I do want to say one thing. Sure. If you ever read a review of Breckenridge, any Breckenridge whiskey, and they talk about, Oh, you know, it's really nice. And you can tell it's really young, but it's going to be great. Like, don't ever go back to that whiskey reviewer and listen to them because we do not ever put young whiskey in a bottle. And it says age a minimum of two years. And so some people say, oh, it must just be two years old. And so they start talking like that. So just a little um, Easter egg for you. Um, don't, you know, if a reviewer talks about a, a Breckenridge whiskey tasting young, they don't know what they're talking about. So go find someone else. And if it was young whiskey, I wouldn't be insulted and I'm not, but I'm just telling you that it's for your education. Yeah. Right. And so, and so when we do see that, whether it's on Breckenridge or other bottles aged at least two years, that can mean that it's a little, a little bit over that, but the minimum of that, but very often with distilleries, it's two years and then much upward as in your case, the very yeah. young, it's probably going to be around four, but even on your standard, uh, bourbon breckenridge bourbon release it we have up to 11 12 year old in there absolutely yeah. and um you'll rarely find anything younger than four years occasionally you'll have like the you'll come across these like almost four-year-old barrels that are just phenomenal and we know when we taste how they're going to change and we'll be like you know what that's got to go in that is just that's going to lose that like super awesome like high rice spice that's just going to get muted in a year from now. So put it in, put it in, you know, and, and we'll do that. But um, yeah, but typically it's, you know, four, four to 12 year. And a lot of like majority of this stuff is probably eight years old. Right. Very nice. And, uh, and again, it's, so it's that blended and then you're going into a barrel for about eight months. You said the second barrel just depends. Uh, no, that eight months is more of like our wine cast finishes. Okay. Um, and, um, I don't remember how long this was in the secondary barrel, but it was longer than that. Um, but the point of the double barrel is you take a perfectly great whiskey, like it's ready to drink. And then you put it into new Oak, which is, to me is like absolutely terrifying. <laughs> so, you're using a whole that's, new barrel. that's what we did. We did. I'm like, I'm like, this is a really bad idea, but if that's what you want, fine. Like, but you're buying it. Even if it sucks, you're buying it. And it, it you know, it turned out, it turned out really good. But um, I don't remember how long like you're going into like your nose is going into that barrel, and you can get tons of barrel. Yeah, lines. big time, yeah. big time. And you know it. It was nice because it, it concentrated oak, but it didn't concentrate young oak. Right. You know, because young oak just ruins. Like it's like I'm done. Like if I smell young oak, I'm done. Um, this one it concentrated the oak, but not not the young angular oak. So it turned out great. Again, testament to Hans, Hans and the team. You know, um, this, and I don't remember how long this was in there, but, um, yeah, I'm going to go year and a half yeah. on my guesstimate until the angular faded and turned into something really nice. So with this sort of thing, it's not as though you're getting a year and a half extra on it. You're getting even more power because the whiskey's already been aged. So there's, oh yeah, there's absolutely. Equation that would probably even be hard to write on how much more barrel you're getting. You're getting a lot more barrel, more than a year. Big time. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, because the wood's extracted. I mean, in two to three years, it's extracted. And now you're just letting flavors concentrate and different compounds interact and kind of go through their cycle, you know, and become older com- compounds. But the oak has been extracted. Um, and so there, it's a very slow process in the change after those first three or four years, you know. And in some cases, depending on, you know, your style of whiskey, um, time, time can do it harm too, you know? And, um, I think, uh, a lot of the weeded bourbons, like the longer they stay in the barrel after call it three years, the, they just lose, they lose character, you know? Um, and the ones that don't are the phenomenal whiskeys that you love that have, you know, that are a couple thousand bucks a bottle, right? Because they've found a way to have a weeded whiskey that just keeps getting better with time. That's hard to do. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a really interesting um, process when you these double these double barrels. We, we've seen some of these, and this one is very very special. Are there any flavors that you taste on the double barrel bourbon that maybe you get on the um, your original bourbon, but you get the more amplified here? Did it has it allowed you to see any new discoveries about flavors from your original um, your blend or? Well, I think it, um, you know, it concentrates oak, which right. is, um, you know, which can't be forced because if you try to force it, you get the angular young oak that you can't get by. Um, but what I do like about this whiskey is it does really intensely concentrate the spice. You know, this is a very spicy whiskey yeah. and that white pepper on there is huge. And that's, you know, what we were known for early on when we were first bottling some of the younger whiskeys and then started blending, you know, some high rye whiskeys as well. You know, we were sort of known for that big rye spice. And um, I guess if anything, this, you know, that's something I I love and appreciate. And it kind of brought it back to me um, to say, you know, say, you know, sometimes maybe it's okay to go out of balance a little bit, you know, and, uh, just to concentrate some things that I like. And um, when we decided to do bourbon, you know, I wanted to make a bourbon that was a little different. And um, uh, what I wanted to do was make a bourbon that a scotch drinker would like, because that's, I came into this as a scotch drinker and also someone who loved rye whiskey. So, uh, but I, I didn't drink a lot of bourbon, you know, then, and then I came to appreciate it after we got going and realized, you know, what was, what, what it was all about. <laughs> but um but yeah, I would say it's a, yeah, it's, I'm keen on working to concentrate more of the white pepper, I think on some yeah. stuff moving the forward. Spice is there. I get the white pepper, maybe even, I mean, I get some, maybe even a touch of clove. I mean, this, with this intensity here. Just, yeah. Some of There's those. Like, um, it's almost like some of like, it's almost like some of the Indian spices, you know, I, I mean, I, yeah, it might not be all the way to clove, but it's, yeah, but there's some of that there. And, you know, I just like, I like one of samosa and some mint chutney, like, with this one because um you know those those spices yeah. are there it's not just rice spice or white pepper it's a super complex mm. um repertoire of spice you know and no one no one does that um in cuisine like indians do i mean that's just right. that spices love is it i love indian food as well and um any chance we'll see this one on a on a larger release uh outside of georgia in the distillery someday you may see this yeah, for sure. Um, so we're um, we are laying down batches of this one too. So um, we will most likely um, uh, do it in Colorado. So you know, Colorado R and D C our distributor here is phenomenal, and um, they've earned it for sure. So we'll let them have it. And um, there will probably be a few other stores or distributors across the country who will will give it to. You. But this. This will be coveted and allocated a lot like the single barrel. And um, and uh, I should have mentioned earlier, the Madeira cast finish is available in Colorado too. So we put that in Colorado. My uh, sales rep pinged me and said, make sure you mention that. So make sure you, you make. <laughs> 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 UPS sales, Mike Haran, cool stuff. <laughs> 
And we enjoy everyone watching us here on Bourbon Blog Live. If you have any more questions, we have some more whiskeys to taste here, but uh, ask questions down below. And if you're loving watching uh, the whiskey tasting at home, I want to invite you to a special series. I do these Bourbon Blog Lives almost every night. We're doing a near, new series of virtual tastings, and I put the shortened link there for you. Uh, www.l ou.ly forward slash tasting. Now, make sure you write that down. Go to that later. This is a new set of tastings I'm doing uh, that you can go buy your tickets for an event ride. It's a little deeper whiskey education with me. And we actually have a way of sending you uh, minis of the whiskeys. And guess which bourbon we're going to have as part of our first tasting uh, next week on September 11th. You want to guess, Brian, what we're going to be having? Um, Pappy or Breckenridge? We're gonna, <laughs> I wish I only wish there was the minis of uh, a Pappy, right? <laughs> We're gonna have some record bourbons in these folks that sign up for this. So, uh, uh, courtesy of Shots Box. So that's one of the wonderful bourbons you get on Shots Box. So, uh, go check out that link. We're getting lots of great people signing up for it. It's uh, it's a way we can come together uh, at home, have a whiskey tasting, have some education, and uh, sign up for that. Get your ticket on that link. Breckenridge being one of the wonderful bourbons we're tasting next week on September 11th, and we'll have more tastings to come. Uh, so these both, uh, these have both been beautiful. The Madeira, then we went to the Double Barrel, and uh, just recently Breckenridge released, and I, I really, I gotta say, this is such a cool bottle and, and such a really unique uh, bourbon. This rum cask finish, there's even this... Um, it looks like a character out of like Greek mythology on here. <laughs> what am I, who am I looking at here on this label as I, this beautiful blue bottle? Uh, who's this guy right here? Uh, yeah, God, God of the Sea there, my friend. <laughs> you don't see too many bourbon bottles with the God of the Sea, and this is serious. Uh, this is the rum cask. It also has uh, the God of the Seas. Um, is that his sword? What, I don't know what I don't know what the name of that tool is. Is that his sword? What, I don't know what I don't know what the name of that tool is. The Trident. To try to thank you very yes. much. <laughs> well thought through. Uh, what inspired this? And tell us about this. Yes, and you also got the azure blue of the of the label yeah. on there. Um, yep. So we, you know, one thing that's um, I guess unique about us, e even though we started um, exclusively as a whiskey house and and you know really intended just to make, to make whiskey. Um, I, I've always appreciated all the classics, classic cocktails, classic spirits. Right. And um, so, you know, we decided to make them. And um, early on, we started making rum and spiced rum. Yeah. And it's one of the most enjoyable things I think we've ever made. Um, so yep. And so we do the spiced rum and our spiced rum was different because um, spiced rum became a category all of a sudden. And, you know, it's, I'm not knocking mass produced spiced rum, but I'm just being honest, you know, it's all, um, it's just fake flavors. It's fake um, cola and fake vanilla flavor yeah. and, um, you know, a lot of sugar and it's mass produced. And I'll be the first to say, that every now and then I'm out at a bar, I want to drink one of those, you know. <laughs> um, but we decided to make spiced rum in the traditional way. So um, all the flavor was done through process of maceration. So we did roots, dried fruit peels, um, spices, barks, all those things. And that's always the way we've made our spiced rum. Um, when we do that, we do it in different fractions. So you put you put them together in a giant basket it's like an enormous tea bag and you, you put it in the tank and, you know, you extract what you want to extract, then you pull that out and then the next fractions go in. But as we were doing this over, you know, longer than a decade, um, as we're sitting there doing that and we're drinking bourbon while we're doing it, we're like, man, that smells really good with this bourbon. And um, you start figuring out what you like and what you don't like and what works and doesn't. And at some point we realized that we had an obligation to to get these things together. And so um, doing a Breckenridge rum cask finish whiskey um, was something we had to do. So it, it took a long time to um, get the balance down because the way we do our spiced rum is there are some big notes that you don't necessarily want like cinnamon and things like that. 
So we had to figure out how to get the right spice rum in the right barrels that would yield max extraction and get what we wanted in this. And we knew it was going to be great. And um, then when we got our first batches perfected, um, it, it made me a little nervous because it was so good that um, I was became afraid that we would never sell any other whiskey again. <laughs> uh, it's that like, I think based off of where the American palate is at, um, this is, um, once you've had this, you may just be like, yeah, I'm good. That's all I'm going to drink from now on. You know what I mean? Um, and it is, it's, it is incredible. It's a, there's a lot of flavor. There's a lot of, of, um, mellow spice that comes together. You can taste all the barks, the roots, the dried fruits, they're all in there. Um, and it's got a mellow sweetness to it. And I don't like sweet whiskeys. Um, but this one is not overly sweet. Um, and surprisingly, <laughs> I love this whiskey, you know, um, the sweeter style whiskeys, I don't, I don't typically care for. Um, but this, this one's man, it's magic for sure. Well done on this. Cheers, Brian, to you and your team. This yeah. is a beautiful, thank you. Beautiful whiskey. Uh, something that really brings together so many characteristics. Um, and it's it's approachable too. It's it's uh, it has that approachability that mild, like you said, mild sweetness, easy, very sessionable. Uh, yep. Complex but relaxed. Uh, this is um, yep. this is one. Are we seeing this across the country right now? Yeah, so um, we're on batch three now, but um, it's hitting the bigger markets first, you know, obviously. Yep. So, Colorado, Illinois, California, tri state area, then, you know, Texas, Virginia, Florida. We kind of will go in order there as to the larger markets. And um, hopefully, we'll soon be everywhere. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we're just, I mean, we're just, we're selling it faster than, than we can put it out. You know, we did, we went through our six month allocation in like three weeks mm. on the wholesale side. So, and then we're like, Oh shit, we got to get on it. In you know, three fortunately, weeks. fortunately we have a 42 foot tall still, so we can make rum fast. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so that's, pr that's pretty quick where, I mean, you knew it would be quick, but did that shock you that it went that quick? Oh yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. I'm a fairly neurotic calculating, <laughs> business owner and so to blow to i mean we yeah i i we sold our what was left for the balance of the year immediately and people said okay we need more and right. um, so we're like okay <laughs> well, oh that's to the uh, barrel we'll get it to you asap incredible a lot of people chip saying it sounds delicious uh ben skiatis actually he says really excited about the rum cask he had a question for you i know he's a uh, owner of lure in henderson kentucky great seafood place not henderson i'm sorry awesome Owensboro, Kentucky, across the river from us. Uh, great seafood place. He loves your Breckenridge. He says that uh, this Kentucky boy loves Breckenridge. Just curious if you'd be interested in doing any barrel picks. You all do single barrel picks with restaurants and accounts. Can you talk about that a little bit? We sure do. Yeah, we'll do um, barrel picks or we'll also do blends. So um, our single barrels tend to, that, that we pull back, we hold back. Um, a concentration of butterscotch and that's a super unique thing in the realm of bourbon. So our soup, super butterscotched up barrels, um, we hold back and that's what we focus on for a single barrel. Um, mo people that, um, are into that, we will do single barrel picks in that realm. Right. Um, most people we do, I'll just be honest. We, most people want a more, of a range to pick from. And uh, so we'll do special blends for them too. But yeah, we could absolutely do either. We can do single barrels. Um, they tend to be butterscotch forward, or we can do blends, which concentrate really anything you want to concentrate, you know, um, we can do because we have a pretty uh, deep range of flavors to pick from. So we can um, focus on spice. We can focus on fruit or vanilla or oak. And that pretty much takes care of most people. The one style of bourbon that we don't really have is like super concentrated esters, like a super banana forward. Um, that is really kind of the only flavor profile uh, we don't have. But anything else, yeah, we absolutely happy to do that. And if uh, do that. bars are listening, liquor stores, how, how do they 
how do they reach out on your single barrel program? What's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I mean, you can uh, you can either talk to your distributor, or if you uh, can't get them, you can just email me. It's Brian with a Y at BreckerRangeDistillery.com, and I'll get you in the in the in the system, and uh, we'll talk and see what you want, and then we can send you samples if your state will allow us to send you samples. Right, right. And everyone who wants to know how to, to just to find out more about Breckenridge Distillery, BreckenridgeDistillery.com, best place to go. And um, rum coming to, probably if you're in a market that already has Breckenridge bourbon, you'll eventually be seeing the rum. Well, you may eventually be seeing all these, right? I mean, that's that's that would be the, some of them more limited than others, but you probably could see all of them eventually, right? Yeah, I mean, you'll definitely, what you should see in your market, no matter where you're at, unless it's a weird control state, is right. you'll have... Breckenridge bourbon, you should have the high proof bourbon at 105, which is my favorite way to drink our bourbon. You so should have good. the pork cask and the PX sherry cask finish. Like those four should be there. Um, you'll most likely be seeing the rum cask pretty quick. You'll most likely see single barrel, not in a lot of liquor stores, but it, it'll probably be in a few. Um, and then um, the Madeira is going to take longer. Uh, the, the, Double, double oak, double cast. It's going to take longer. Um, but give it time. You'll see them all. The, yep. the, the, yeah, the super one-offs like Chateau Kim, Sauternes, those babies are gone. Powder Hound, you'll, you'll never get that outside of um, the distillery. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, all the one-offs. Some of them you're going to have to go all the way to the distillery for and definitely check out the distillery and the restaurant. And again, some of my favorite bourbon and spirits and people in the world, you guys do an amazing job there. And uh, it's always fun chatting with Brian Nolt from Breckenridge Distillery. And uh, these are these are all delicious. I, I, the, I tell you, the rum, I, I know I was so excited about the rum uh, for a while because you told me about it, Brian, and it just it was all that and even mm -hmm. more. It's something so elegant. And yeah. approachable and, and complex on so many levels. Uh, and then what I also love is just get some of the Breckenridge rum, too. The Breckenridge rum is such a unique rum. I mean, it's just so, so sippable and good. And as I know, yeah. Brian will also agree because he enjoys cigars, a great pairing for some cigars, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. I'll really? me a KFC, Kentucky Fire Cure from Drew That's Estate right. with a PX uh, finish. Oh, we just had a we, – we just had a uh, – Unexpected uh, whiskey pairing, whiskey uh, cigar pairing in American Whiskey Magazine this month. Oh wow! I what saw in they had the port cask with a Arturo Fuente, um, and uh, I'm gonna go buy me a box of them Fuentes and give it a shot because um, I trust those guys. Yeah, I'd love to try that. <laughs> and, one your, and but one of your favorites is doing that uh, PX with a, a KFC or, or a lot of them with the KFC. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love that KFC cigar. That's like my go-to cigar. Uh, but I will say that um, almost no matter what cigar you're smoking, it'll go with uh, the, the PX cast finished Breckenridge. That's just, that's magic. I mean, really from mild to like enormous cigars there that the magic just happens on that one. So um, if you want to be a hero in your neighborhood, man, uh, <laughs> you know, pair, <laughs> pair good those up and, we need those neighborhood oh, heroes now, and you can be one. You're right. We do, yeah. <laughs> Breckenridge PX. Uh, man, Just wear your mask and keep your gatherings to whatever, however many people are less. And, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Six feet apart. I like it, buddy. Well, well done. We'll all share of cigars. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Breckenridge Whiskey Madeira finish. That was the first one. Again, this wonderful, uh, which you'll really have to look for for now unless you're in Georgia or Breckenridge. Double barrel. And then also rum cask, all delicious whiskeys. Brian, such a pleasure seeing you as always. Maybe maybe next time we come back, we'll um maybe we'll do it. Maybe we will do it. Maybe we'll have to do a cigar pairing episode with you. Ooh, that'd be nice. Yeah, there's probably that'd some place nice. there. Uh, you can find one of those cigars and a bottle of whiskey. I bet we could do that. Let's 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 look at doing that. You can make that happen. Yes, buddy. Cheers and cheers to your team there in Breckenridge, Brian, and cheers to everyone joining us tonight. If you did happen to uh, join us kind of um, late into the video, this video will be up permanently wherever you are, and we'll also be putting the audio up on our podcast channel, which is just down below. If you're not already subscribed to our podcast channel, subscribe. Cheers, Brian. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks, Tom. Take care, everyone. Absolutely.